Presenting history's best on PBS. Two thousand three hundred years ago, Alexander the Great invaded Asia. His goal to conquer the Persian Empire. We followed in his footsteps a twenty thousand mile journey from Greece to the plains of India. By the fifth year of the war. Persia had fallen, and the Persian king had been killed. Alexander now set out to overrun their vast eastern empire, and he headed for Afghanistan. In the footsteps of Alexander the Great was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the annual financial support of PBS viewers like you. Afghanistan. Our journey now brought us into a modern day war. The old city had been devastated. A crossroads on the ancient routes to India, Kabul has been a battleground for more than two thousand years. The city had been devastated by war. Alexander wintered here in the fifth year of his campaign. He founded a new city close by, another Alexandria, one more step towards uniting the world under Greek rule. For his teacher Aristotle had taught him it was fitting that Greeks should rule barbarians. Settled with Greek and native colonists, Alexander's city would foster a remarkable mixed culture, Greek and Asiatic. I was hoping to see its treasures in Kabul Museum, but that rich legacy—the glass from Egypt, the ivories from India, Chinese lacquer—was all gone. What's left is locked down in the cellars, and even that has been looted and smashed. How did you feel when you saw this? When we came to the museum, we were very surprised. When we saw all this, the museum director said, "It was as if our mother and father had died. Our whole history was here." چرا که این آثاره که شما می‌بینید؟ گریس می‌گوید. بولیس تهل. شکر دارم. Look, here's a there's a Greek period Buddha. He's wearing a Greek toga. That's the kind of fusion of East and West that happened in the art too in Afghanistan. This was an absolutely unique civilization, and this museum, the chief record of it in the world. Oh, it's just heartbreaking. It was a somber introduction to Afghan history, but this is a tale of war. And war destroys the past as well as the present. We 
had no idea what to expect on the road ahead. As Alexander saw it that winter, the eastern part of the Persian Empire was still unconquered. The Greek historian Arian says a Persian nobleman, Bessus, had proclaimed himself king of Asia and was rallying resistance. It was Bessus who had murdered the previous king, Darius. Now he'd retreated north beyond the Hindu Kush mountains, thinking Alexander wouldn't try to cross till the snows had gone. Alexander took up the challenge. The next stage of our journey was to follow Alexander over the Hindu Kush, but to get out there we needed a vehicle. Mm, certainly is a Land Rover. So, do you think we'll get all the way up the Pantheon with this? Yes, I'm sure. Really? I'm the real one. Of course, all over Afghanistan. Really? <laughs> so you're the expert then, are you, Mr. Zelme? Alexander had burned his wagons when he entered Afghanistan. They slowed the army, they were always breaking down. So his troops crossed the country entirely on foot or horseback. Early in the spring, Alexander set off. Ahead of him, the great mass of the Hindu Kush, which rises to 20,000 feet. On the other side, his enemy Bessus was waiting. There were three main passes. Bessus expected Alexander to come the direct route, and he devastated the land there to deny Alexander supplies. But Alexander never did what was expected. He chose the longer eastern route and went up the Panchia Valley, heading for the Khawak Pass. Travelling up the Panchia Valley today, it's almost impossible to believe that a great army could have made its way through here. But they did. Throughout the whole of history, armies had to find a way over the Hindu Kush. And uh, this tended to be the favourite route. Uh, Tamburlaine the Great, for example, came this way on his way from the Oxus to India in 1398. And your main problem, especially in the spring, was not the terrain, but was the cold and especially the lack of food and provisions. And as it turned out, that was exactly the problem that Alexander faced. people had buried their winter supplies to foil the Macedonian foragers, so Alexander's men had to take their own food with them. Our Land Rover soon began to struggle. Alexander had been right. Wheeled vehicles can be a liability on these roads. Russians also found their mechanized gear failed here against men fighting on foot and supplied by mule. Eventually, our Land Rover would go no further. Davy, can you hear me? We've developed a very bad clonking noise suddenly. It sounds as if it could be the half shop. So we're, we're going to pull in, OK? And it wasn't the last of our problems. The road is uh, closed. The road is closed? Yeah, because of uh, landslide. And where is this? Could you ask the gentleman? Uh, just uh, after five minutes, 
Oh, oh, really? Really? Yeah. Yeah. And, if, and impossible for vehicles to get through? Or? It's impossible. Only donkeys. <laughs> Told you we should use donkeys on this part of the trip. <laughs> We were obviously here for the night, so we went back to the nearest village. What is the name of the village where we leave the cars and we start to walk up to the pass? Hawak. 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 That's Hawak. Yeah, that's Hawak. 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 Hawak village. And Hawak is after Dasht e Reba. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Alexander always used local guides. If they did well, they were rewarded. If they misled him, they were killed. Simple but effective. Is it easy to find the men with the horses? So Halil organizes the job for him all the way to India. We abandoned our Land Rover and took a lift on towards the foot of the pass. travelers walking in long zigzags up the hillsides. It was easy to imagine the Macedonians doggedly trudging forward. This road was actually only made up for cars a few years ago and until that point it was really a track that only horses could use. And although Alexander's army must have been able to uh, come along the river valley in that, those wide open spaces in the early part of the Panchia, here they would have been single file. So it would have taken them hours to pass any given point. And the army must have stretched for 10 miles, who knows, maybe all the way back down the Panchia, which explains why it took 17 days to cross. we reached our goal, the horse station below the pass. And there was Commander Halil. It's a bit like the Wild West out here, and for a moment the atmosphere seemed threatening. Well, how much does it cost per, per horse? to take a horse over from here in Al Khawak all the way to Andara over the pass. Mega az aminja ta khod Khawak am kutal Khawak ki as pas inja amroy ma bura pas be qimat es chand as aminja ta unja chand as pas me chand as che qasam shuma amir. To Khawak ko chand ni bara. Khawak ni to wel na wel ni ma. Ya to wel na wel ni ma. Ya to wel na wel ni ma. Ya to wel na wel ni 
It's uh, the price of uh, per horse is uh, sixty thousand yeah. Afghani. Okay. But you are our guest. Uh, we will yeah. give you discount fifty thousand oh. oh, Afghani. That's very kind. That's very, that's very kind. And well, and well, to our man will escort you oh, to the top of pass. That's very that's kind. That's for your safety. Well, well. Thank you very much yeah. indeed. Thank you. Okay. We loaded up. Our pack horses took a hundred kilos each, the same as Alexander's. His men, though, had to carry their own gear and backpacks. That would get tough at high altitude. surprise we saw people traders refugees families the Khawak was still the thoroughfare to the north as it's been throughout history <laughs> that night we ate with the local commander he recognized our cameraman, Peter, who'd covered the war with the Russians. We were the first Westerners through here since then. <coughs> On Alexander's march, the Greeks said, the people here had never seen foreigners before. <laughs> Alexander's mind was now totally concentrated on defeating Bessus. And here on the pass that night, I could almost feel the magnetism of Alexander's leadership and the sheer excitement that his men must have felt marching with him. Next day, the track went higher, the air was thinner and the land more barren. For us, as no doubt for the Greeks, walking was now an effort. As the crossing went into its second week, they ran out of grain and started killing the pack animals for food. But there was no firewood for cooking and they had to eat the flesh raw. This they did, says Arian, with the juice of a medicinal plant, silphium. So can you ask which, which part of the plant they use for medicine? <laughs> So you get a juice out of it, do you? Yeah, yeah. And you can use it. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's a tiny detail, but just imagine it. Cold water, raw horse meat, and the bitter juice of the sylphium. They were over 11,000 feet now, and the starving troops were suffering from chronic fatigue brought on by altitude sickness. We brought few supplies with us, and we took our snacks where we could find them. I say this is good stuff for, um, for long distance travelling. The uh, these dried mulberries compressed together and it's the kind of dried fruit that the 
Mujahideen lived on and during the war with the Russians in these mountains. It's, it keeps your energy up. At such times, Alexander was inspirational. He'd run up and down the column, cheering the men, giving a helping hand, lifting those who'd fallen, unflagging. Just below the summit, there was gunfire. Our guards raced off. There were bandits ahead. Mike, can you get out of the way? It's dangerous. Later, we got the all clear. Alexander's men had seen all those years before. We're here, Shazad. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. We made it. The top of the Kamak Pass is about 12,000 feet, and there the road stretching away down to the land of Bactria and former Soviet Central Asia. And around us, the mountains of the Hindu Kush. The Greeks knew that these mountains were part of a continuous uh, chain which split Asia in two and was the source of all the great rivers of Asia. And following Ale Alexander's footsteps up here with this wind, you can really feel whatever you think about him, what an amazing achievement it was to drive an army over these mountains. Nothing stopped him, said the historian Arian. Nothing put him off. He just kept coming on and on, whatever the cold or the starvation. He drove on, and in the end, his enemies were struck with fear at the speed of his advance. I'll bet they were. Bessus was nowhere to be seen. The gamble had paid off. Just below the summit, a cairn of stones is said to mark the burial place of the Greeks who didn't make it. On the other side of the Hindu Kush, in northern Afghanistan, they found good fishing in the rivers. There were big herds of livestock too. There was plenty of grain here. They could draw breath and fill their bellies. We, though, were still traveling through a civil war. We now had to cross the lands of the local warlord, and there was the tricky matter of a front line to negotiate. I have a letter from General Harun. As chance would have it, I'd met the head of the local garrison in London before we set out. He'd written me a letter of introduction to his front line commanders. Okay. You are most welcome to Pulihumbi. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, I'll wait then. So we waited. 
With the fundamentalist armies of the Taliban closing in on Kabul, we weren't too keen to retrace our steps. Arun's career has had its ups and downs. He once delivered pizzas in Pennsylvania. Then he was summoned home by the family to a very different life. At the beginning it was so difficult for me, but now I used to it, you know. Yeah. You can just be travelling along a quiet country road and you run into some group that you've never heard of who decide yeah. they want to kidnap you for a bit. Of course, yeah. That but there's, you know, uh, but I believe that, you know, this time of life is in Afghanistan is more uh, risky than, than the 16 years ago, than the beginning of the revolution. Yeah. So is your life in, in danger yeah. frequently here? Of course, yes. In this country, even your life yeah. is in danger yeah. when you come to this country. <laughs> Alexander, though, met no resistance. The people of this part of Bactria, the Greeks said, are prosperous. They grow grapes here and have all manner of fruits. It was a little haven. Warlord's house wasn't quite what I expected, but soldiers are the same everywhere, I guess, for all the guns and high tech. The Macedonians, perhaps, were much like the Afghans, brave, tough, pious. They lived hard and played hard, like soldiers throughout history. The news that night was gloomy. Rockets were falling on Kabul. We'd got through just in time. Next day, as we got ready to head north, Harun's tanks were rumbling through the streets. They were moving their forces back towards the mountains. Poor Afghanistan. Now I began to understand Alexander's world. We hired a battered Russian pickup and drove on in Alexander's tracks. Bessus was on the run and Alexander pursued him like a hunter towards the river Oxus, which divides Afghanistan from Central Asia. The road goes through a wasteland covered by moving sand dunes, just as the Greeks describe. But they weren't carrying enough water and they lost their way. Imagine, it was midsummer, blazing heat. They had to cross this great belt of shifting sand dunes and they had no water. They probably had to camp here for two nights. And then they made the fundamental, unbelievable mistake of broaching the wine supplies because they had nothing else to drink. It made them feel better for the moment, said one of the Alexander historians, but the after effects were terrible. Maybe they had no choice, but Alexander's elite ended up hung over and dehydrated, stumbling over sand dunes, trying to find the Oxus River.
The Greeks reached this place just about the same time of the day, late afternoon, early evening. And when they saw the river, the troops were so thirsty that they all piled down to the riverbanks and just started drinking. And there were a lot of deaths due to over consumption of the water of the river, which isn't particularly good, apparently. In desperation, Bessas had burned all the riverboats, but Alexander made rafts from tents stuffed with straw and ferried his troops across in five days. Bessas was running out of places to hide. Our journey now took us into Central Asia, to Uzbekistan, and the road to Samarkand. Despite the intense heat, Alexander advanced relentlessly. Then, a very strange thing happened. Somewhere on this road, Alexander came to a small town. To his surprise, the people here spoke Greek. As Alexander and his officers strolled around, they saw Greek faces in the marketplace. The townspeople had quite a tale to tell. Their ancestors had been Greeks from the Aegean coast of Turkey. Though bilingual now, they still kept up Greek customs. but they had a dark secret. Their ancestors were the priestly family of the Temple of Didyma, the Branchidae. 150 years before, they'd collaborated with the Persians in the hated war which Alexander had vowed to avenge. So what would Alexander do now? Early next morning, Alexander came through the gate with a small detachment of troops, apparently to receive the hospitality of the Branchidae. In fact, during the night, the army had been given instructions to surround the town. And at a prearranged signal, they began to attack, with the intention of massacring everybody inside. The Branchidae had suspected nothing. But despite their kinship of language, their desperate entreaties, the fact that they were holding olive branches in their hands, the symbol of peace, the savagery didn't stop until everybody had been killed. And afterwards, the Greeks leveled the town, destroyed its walls and even cut down its woods and sacred groves so that no trace remained. The expedition historian Callisthenes did his best to justify the massacre. The aim of Alexander's crusade, after all, had been to punish Persian wrongs. Arian, though, says nothing. I imagine he felt that, however you gloss it over, a war crime is still a war crime. Alexander now received word that support for Bessus was crumbling in the face of the Macedonians' lightning advance. Alexander sent his general Ptolemy on ahead to arrest him. The last resistance in the Persian Empire, he thought, had now collapsed. Ptolemy left Alexander behind, pushed on as fast as he could up this road towards Samarkand with light-armed cavalry. He did a 10-day march in four days. This kind of heat, summer heat, really hard men. Bessus' supporters were just terrified. They turned him over to the Greeks. When Alexander arrived, he was standing by the roadside, humiliated, naked, in a wooden dog collar. Bessus met a gruesome end. His nose and ears were cut off, and he was sent back to Persia to be impaled the Persian punishment for traitors.
Alexander pushed on to the Sir Darya River, the outermost edge of the Persian Empire. Here he founded a city, which he called Alexandria the Fathermost. It's still here today, Hojent in Tajikistan. To understand why he stopped here, we have to imagine the world as he saw it. As far as he knew, he was near the northern edge of the world here. Beyond the Sir Darya lay only a belt of arid plains as far as the great ocean which encircled the earth. There was no point in going any further. To mark his northern limit, Alexander built altars to his favorite god Dionysus, perhaps on the very spot where now there's a great statue of Lenin monument to another tide of history which has come and gone. It's a nice place, the farthermost. I think the Greek colonists might have felt quite at home here, figs and olives in the market. Alexander said he hoped the town would one day become rich and famous. Perhaps he remembered the words of his teacher, Aristotle, that civilization will only thrive on cities and trade. Gent was one of more than 20 Alexandrias the king founded between Egypt and India. The empire was linked by a system of post horses and racing camels. The troops received letters from home. Medical supplies came out here by the ton. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander even had his favorite books and fresh fruit sent out here from Greece. My parcel came from a friend in Athens. <laughs> Great, a Greek newspaper. That's nice to have. Olives, Greek olives. Aristotle was right. The fruits of civilization. Ah. A bottle of now, sir. But the local people were not prepared to buy into the idea of a Greek world empire. That summer, the famed horsemen of Bactria were gathering. The Sogdians too came out in revolt. For 2,000 years or more, they bred the finest horses in Asia here, and they fought the kind of war Alexander had not prepared for. No battles, just hit and run. You can imagine what he was up against when you see them play Buz Kashi. And this is just a game. Alexander couldn't beat us because we were such good horsemen, the old man said. Even an 80-year-old could ride and throw a spear. As horsemen, we had greatness. Our forefathers used to say, the horse is the wings of the man. A horse is strong and fearless, like a fierce spirit. In heavy fighting, Alexander was seriously wounded in the head and throat and lost both sight and speech. Worse was to follow. A Macedonian column was wiped out near Samarkand, their first defeat in 30 years. At his base on the Sir Darya River, he suddenly found himself crippled 
and at bay. Alexander was now one of the lowest points in his entire career. Surrounded by enemies, he was suffering from a leg wound, he had malnutrition, dysentery coming on, his throat wound had not healed, so he could hardly speak, his voice was so quavering the people even close to him couldn't hear him. He couldn't stand in the ranks, he couldn't ride a horse, he couldn't give his army encouragement and instructions, the very thing on which his generalship depended. There's a vivid image of Alexander at this moment, opening his tent flap at night to gaze across the river at the twinkling fires of the nomad armies. Being Alexander, though, he had to act. He forced his way across the river and won a stunning victory, even though his dysentery was now so bad he had to be carried back. Now began his hardest war. That winter he regrouped in bulk. The next spring, massively reinforced, he took fire and sword across Central Asia. Five mobile army groups, 50,000 men, spread up the river valleys of Tajikistan in a search and destroy operation almost as far as China. In the autumn, they reunited at Samarkand. Samarkand, the most famous and glamorous city on the Silk Route. In Alexander's day, it was the chief town of Sogdia, today's Uzbekistan. Here, that September, took place one of the most fateful incidents of Alexander's life. Just outside the city gate lies the mound of the ancient town and the remains of the Sogdian palace. One night, Alexander held a banquet here. Among the guests was a veteran cavalry officer called Clytus. One of Alexander's father's generation, Clytus had saved Alexander's life back in the early days. With everyone drunk, the evening turned nasty. Alexander was harping on about his relationship with his father. Clearly felt very embittered and competitive. It's real Freudian stuff. My father never gave me the credit for my part in his victories, he said. Bore me ill will and jealousy. Clytus, who was one of the old guards, stood up. He said, everything you have achieved was based on what your father did. In fact, your father's achievements are far greater than yours. And he won them fighting men, not women. At this point, Alexander, who'd been relatively calm and unruffled, flew into a rage. He threw fruit at Clytus, tried to grab a spear in order to hit him, and kept calling out in Macedonian to give the alarm for the royal bodyguards to come in. Alexander's friends, meanwhile, had grabbed hold of Clytus, and they pulled him out of the door and actually got him across the moat over there. But just when everybody thought everything was over, in comes Clytus again. Here I am, Alexander. Alexander grabs a long spear from one of the guards at the door and runs him through. There's blood everywhere, and Alexander collapses onto the body in a drink-sodden heap in floods of tears. Some said Clytus got what was coming to him, and the king now suspended freedom of speech. But at the tomb of Tamburlaine, Another tyrant or hero, depending on your point of view, the words of an eyewitness came to mind, who spoke of the fear which people round Alexander now felt. He was a very violent man, with no regard for human life, who was said to be melancholy mad. Meanwhile, Alexander had still not crushed the Central Asian revolt, the ringleaders were holding out in the rugged mountains on the Tajik-Uzbek border. With their wives and children, they'd taken refuge on an inaccessible peak known as the Sogdian Rock. But where was the rock? It's never been found. We were sleeping at a village high in the mountains. Hearing of our search for the rock, 
Over breakfast, the local men showed us an old manuscript of the Alexander legend. There were old traditions, they said, that Alexander had come this way and that the lost citadel of Sogdia lay in the mountains close by. Stories like this are ten a penny in these parts where you'll find Alexander's legend everywhere. But my ears pricked up when they began to tell us about a mountain, a day's walk from their village. This their forefathers had told them was the Sogdian rock. They offered to take us there. It seemed worth a try. The mountain lies right in the heart of ancient Sogdia. It's called Hazrati Sultan. It's 14,000 feet high, and the last few thousand feet form a sheer cliff. The Sogdians thought they were safe. Alexander was about to give up attempting to seize the Sogdian rock, but one of the ambassadors who came down from the Sogdians irritated him so much Arian says that he had to go on and seize it in pursuit of glory. The ambassador simply said, in response to Alexander's demand for them to surrender, just find soldiers who can fly. Nobody else is going to be of any concern to us. Alexander asked for volunteers with experience in mountain climbing. 300 men came forward, herdsmen from the Macedonian uplands. They took ropes, made pitons from iron tent pegs, the climb was difficult enough for our local guides, but Alexander's men did it at night, on the back face where they wouldn't be seen. <laughs> on the other side, a narrow path led to a ravine which was massively defended. Thirty-two of Alexander's climbers died on the rock. Dawn the next day, Alexander's 300 mountaineers appeared over the top of the ridge up there, waving flags. The barbarians, said Arian, were absolutely staggered. They had simply not thought it was possible. Alexander's herald rushed up to their front line and shouted across to them. You better surrender now, he said. You see, I found the soldiers who could fly. The rebels gave up there and then. The story was remembered ever after as proof of Alexander's almost superhuman powers. comes the most amazing twist in the tale. For a peace was finally broken, not through war, but through love. At least, that was how the Greeks told it. One night, a splendid banquet was held by one of the Sogdian barons, Alexander's erstwhile enemy, Oxyates. It was a feast of typical barbarian splendor, the Greeks said. I imagine not unlike the great Uzbek wedding feasts you see today. At the feast was the baron's beautiful daughter, Roxanne, Little Star. She'd been captured on the Sogdian rock, 
Now, with her girlfriends, she danced before the king. When Alexander set eyes on her, Arian says, it was love at first sight. With the same impulsiveness which had killed Clytus, Alexander proposed to Roxanne. With his sword, he cut the bread, as they still do to mark an engagement in Uzbek land. He was 29, she at a guest in her mid-teens. His friends were staggered, to put it mildly. He'd had a relationship with a woman before, but his real intimacies, emotional and physical, had been with men. And to cap it all, he ordered some of his generals to marry the local women too. Was it really love, or just a clever political ploy? Who can say? Alexander's marriage with Roxanne sealed the conquest of Central Asia. He now returned with his new bride to Balkh in northern Afghanistan to prepare for the invasion of India. We flew there in a warlord's helicopter. Alexander's expedition would open up the heart of Asia and for a thousand years after the Greeks, Balkh would be the greatest crossroads on the Silk Route to China. You can see its ruins below us, the walls stretching for seven miles with the remains of a hundred Buddhist monasteries, Zoroastrian fire temples, and later Christian and Jewish settlements, and the huge mosques of the Muslim period. When the Arabs came here in the seventh century, they called it simply the mother of cities. still had another card to play in this story. Here in Balkh, Alexander announced that he wished to be worshipped as a god, Persian style. You can imagine how that went down among the Macedonian veterans. And now for the first time there was a serious plot against Alexander's life. A group of royal pages planned to assassinate him. They were betrayed and tortured to death. But the dissension over Alexander's divinity climaxed in a sensational falling out with the man who'd helped create Alexander's image, Aristotle's nephew, the historian Callisthenes. The final rift took place here in the citadel at Balkh after a, a bitter exchange. Callisthenes left the royal presence and turned to reiterate two or three times a single line from Alexander's favourite book, the Iliad. The line is this, a better man than you by far was Patroclus, but still death did not spare him. In other words, you're not a god, Alexander. The king's response was predictably savage. Using the page's plot as a pretext, he arrested Callisthenes and had him tortured and crucified. Of all Alexander's deeds, it was said, this left the bitterest taste. For everyone agreed Callisthenes was innocent, yet he was brutally killed without trial. It was the act of a tyrant. And as Aristotle said, no one freely endures such rule. Alexander had already achieved more, perhaps, than he could have dreamed, but now the question was no longer his ability to do things, but whether his men would still follow him on into the unknown. To learn more about Michael Wood and his journey in the footsteps of Alexander the Great, visit our website at PBS Online www.pbs.org
in the footsteps of Alexander the Great was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the annual financial support of PBS viewers like you. This is History's Best on PBS. Two thousand three hundred years ago, Alexander the Great invaded Asia. His goal to conquer the Persian Empire. We followed in his footsteps a twenty thousand mile journey from Greece to the plains of India. By the eighth year of the war, Alexander had defeated the peoples of Central Asia. And now he turned towards India, heading for what he believed would be the end of the earth. footsteps of Alexander the Great was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the annual financial support of PBS viewers like you. Our journey now brought us from Afghanistan into the northwest frontier of Pakistan by the Khyber Pass. In the spring of 326 BC, astonished local people would have seen 60,000 Greeks tramping down these hills. <laughs> we came down into Pakistan in the company of some British train spotters. They'd come to see the Khyber Railway built under the British Empire. I was looking for traces of an older past, but the strategic importance of the Khyber has never changed since the dawn of history. It's always been the main invasion route into India, and the Macedonians crossed it that spring to enter an exotic and mysterious land. In those days, a thousand years before the coming of Islam, Hindu India began at the Indus. That's where the name comes from. Indian people were a source of rumor and myth to the Greeks. They have the strangest customs on earth, the Greeks said. To Alexander, it must have been simply irresistible. We now followed his track up into the northwest frontier of Pakistan. You can imagine Alexander driving his troops over these passes. 29 now, no longer young. Tough, stocky, hard-bitten little man. His iron constitution not yet wrecked by the wounds, malaria, the drinking bouts, the sexual excess. As he came over these passes, he'll have remembered the words of his tutor, Aristotle, who said that from this point, it ought to be possible to see the ends of the earth and the great ocean that the Greeks believed surrounded it. Well, Alexander now knew for sure that this was wrong, that uh, vast and densely populated lands lay ahead, and he was driven to see them. The question now becomes not when's he going to stop, but how far can he go? Alexander planned the invasion of India as a two-pronged attack. The main army headed down through Peshawar to the Indus. Alexander himself cut north, perhaps to explore as much as to fight. And there we discovered a living connection with his story. These are the Kalash, the black pagans of the Hindu Kush, a tiny survival in a surrounding sea of Islam. 
They follow ancient gods and speak a language distantly akin to Greek. The people welcomed Alexander and they told him an amazing story. They too were worshippers of the Greek god of ecstasy, Dionysus. Alexander had once again hit gold. From his mother's knee, Alexander had been told tales of Dionysus, how he'd been born far out to the east. Now the people took him to sacrifice on the very mountain where they said Dionysus had been born. To Alexander, it was an unmistakable sign that God was here. Alexander joined them, wearing an ivy crown, drunk on their wine, dancing for the god, just as his mother used to do. And today the Kalash add another twist to the tale. They say some of the Greeks stayed on here under one of Alexander's generals, Shalak Shah. They married local women, and we, the Kalash, are their direct descendants. If the story was true, I drank wine that night with the descendants of Alexander's army. Alexander now marched on up the valley of the river Swat. In their thousands, refugees now fled in terror eastwards. They took shelter on a rock fortress high above the Indus Valley, a place the Greeks called Aeonos. The rock was said to be impregnable. The Greeks were told that even Hercules had failed to take it when he wandered the earth on his twelve labors. It towered a mile above the river Indus. Its summit, a long curving ridge with enough cultivation to keep a thousand men busy. Today it's called Pearsar. There was only one path up which joined the mountain along the ridge from the west. On Piersar, Alexander would surpass even himself. We set out to climb Piersar in the Macedonians' footsteps. It's a wild region here, and the district officer gave us guides and armed police to drive off wolves and bandits. Thank you very much. <laughs> the path was backbreaking. Five miles along a narrow saddle, a tortuous trek which Alexander's men did at night with snow still in the gullies. the Greeks, their advance guard was led by local guides up onto the rock and they came on a secret path and there's only one way that could be, it's this. It comes across this narrow neck of land which is the only way you can get onto the rock. The ground as you can see falls away dramatically on either side with huge crags on either side so this must be the route that the Greeks took. <laughs> As the path got worse and worse, 
I found myself wondering why he'd bothered. Were the people on top such a threat to him? The only explanation I could come up with was what the Greeks called Alexander's pothos, his desire to surpass even the gods. By nightfall, we'd become separated. Our guides were lost. We're gonna stop here! It was pitch dark before we found somewhere to stay, an abandoned mosque used in summer by the shepherds. It's been an absolutely terrible walk. The terrain is just up and down and uh, even the donkeys could hardly make it. Um, much worse than crossing the Khawak Pass in the Hindu Kush. Right. Uh, it almost made me believe that, that they couldn't have come this way. It's so difficult. You couldn't get an army through there. But if they did, if this was the way, then it is the most amazing demonstration of their uh, absolute determination to overcome their enemies. The, to show the Indian people that there, there was nowhere to hide and that all resistance would be futile. Next day, in a chill dawn, we looked down on the Indus from 8,000 feet. At six o'clock, after cold water and biscuits, we blearily prepared to carry on. It never ceased to amaze me how Alexander was able to inspire his men. They must have been tough old birds, these Macedonians. That's all I can say. At nearly 9,000 feet, we reached the top of the ridge above Piersar. To the north, the snow-capped peaks of the Karakoram. Alexander's men now discovered that a deep ravine lay between them and Piersar itself. And unbelievable as it may seem, Alexander ordered his troops to bridge it. There was about a 500 yard gap that the Greeks needed to bridge. And one tradition says it took seven days and seven nights with the soldiers working in relays. Each soldier had to cut a uh, hundred stakes. And the engineers presumably were digging big piles in the side of this space here. And they laid a mat of trees, earth and so on. And, and it rose higher and higher until maybe more than a hundred feet above my head. It must have looked something like one of those trestle railway bridges that you see in the in the Wild West. And uh, within the week, they'd built the causeway up enough to allow their catapults and artillery to concentrate on the Indian defenders. And then the fate of the rock was sealed. The Indians tried to surrender, but Alexander swept along the ridge and massacred them or drove them off the cliffs. On top, he left an altar to Athena as goddess of victory. Looking out towards the roof of the world, Alexander could reflect he had surpassed even Hercules himself. Back on the Indus, Alexander's engineers had built a huge bridge of boats ready for the crossing. It must have taken them several days. By now, the army was like a moving city. There were 64,000 infantry, 12,000 cavalry, camp followers, women, children, scientists, poets, even entertainers. And the surveyors who were still measuring every step from Greece to the end of the earth. And that was getting closer every day. He marched 
marched on south towards the Great Salt Range. Long before the Grand Trunk Road, this was the ancient route into India. When you come over the Great Salt Range, suddenly a wonderful view opens up. The Jhelum River, the first of the five great rivers of the Punjab, and beyond the plains of India stretching away as far as the Ganges itself, the heartland of Indian civilization. For the Greek troops and their leadership, it must have been an extraordinary moment after all the thousands of miles that they'd traveled. And from now on, they'd be marching into the unknown. Across the Jhelum, the local Indian Rajah, Porus, had massed a powerful army with 200 war elephants. He was determined to stop Alexander crossing. Somehow, Alexander had to get his forces over in secret. The Greeks said he did it where a spur of the salt range comes down to the river plain to form a headland. I went looking for it at the little village of Jalalpur. And there, I met the general. General Shafka. How are Michael you? Wood. Nice to meet you, sir. Very nice to meet you. And what a wonderful place this is. General well, Shafkat's uh, family owns the shrine here. A veteran of latter-day campaigns, he'd lectured on Alexander at Staff College, and he'd got it all worked out. from, and the battlefield is right in front of you. This is the battlefield right here. Across the river. Why are you so sure? Well, if you go through the uh, Greek historians, they mentioned a uh, headland from the main range of the hills. And this is the only place where we had the headland and we were standing right on top of that one. And on the far side, according to the historian, there was a ravine where he had his cavalry and other forces during the day and the night and crossed it across to the island which still exists. And this, as a matter of fact, out of this whole range of hills, this is the only place where he could have crossed. Wonderful, wonderful. The general offered to show us how Alexander did it. Alexander's plan was to hold Porus in front of him and then to cross higher upstream, a flanking move repeated through history down to the Napoleonic Wars and Desert Storm. Now that is a classic movement of encircling or outflanking move where you have either both flanks or the center, lean across the enemy's major force and attract their attention. And sure as if they were going to cross, or keep them amused in general terms, and go around and on a flanking movement and hit him either on the flank or at the back. Well, Napoleon tried it again and again. Uh -huh. Austerlitz is one of the most classical examples. We took a small force of cavalry in the boats. Our infantry crossed on bales of straw, just as the Greeks did. According to the historian Arian, Alexander also had some prefabricated boats. Alexander went in a 30 oared boat, so they've yeah. got quite a number of them. Yeah, they could probably take a lot of troops. But the cavalry, he says, came across on rafts that they'd made and prepared beforehand, stuffed with... They, they must be with planks on top, stuffed with straw, local yeah. brush and things. No, no. We make them in a different manner, only to take the infantry across. Awesome. What, do you still use them in we, the army we do, in yes, the time? Yes, we do. In, during World War II, Iravadi and, and uh, Burma campaign, most of the troops always crossed on these rafts. Amazing. The general decided I was so woefully ignorant of military matters, I should get first-hand experience of what Alexander's men went through. With this kind of stuff. This has been going on in the, on the Burma front during World War II. Yeah. Most of the crossings were done on this thing, at night. Yeah. Alexander had done it before, of course, but remember this time it was at night, pitch dark, pouring rain and rising flood waters. <laughs> Up 
Alexander used tents made of sewn animal skins, which were watertight. We had an old tarpaulin. And just before we reached the deep channel, we should have gone first, the middle one and the two others climbed simultaneously on both sides. Otherwise, you will tilt it and get water abroad. The battle took place near the little village of Sikandapur. Surrounded and surprised, Porus had little chance against one of the hardest armies which has ever existed. It was a horrible scene, the rain, the churned up rice paddies, the Macedonians jabbing their long spears into the elephant's eyes. The elephants were maddened by their suffering, says Arian, trampling friend and foe alike. Porus's army was wiped out and he surrendered. But Alexander was so impressed by his bravery that he gave him his kingdom back. Porus became his ally. The march restarted around midsummer, right in the middle of the monsoon rains. It must have been the last straw for the Greek troops, the wet, the muggy heat, the mosquitoes. As any old India hand will tell you, during the rains nothing ever gets dry, your gear and weapons rust, clothes rot, wounds don't heal. And there was no end to the fighting. Casualties mounted remorselessly. We followed Alexander by road and entered today's India north of the Sikh holy city of Amritsar. Nearby we picked up two taxis to take us on to Alexander's appointment with destiny by the banks of the river Bias. In early September, Alexander reached the Bias, at the crossing place of one of the ancient routes through North India. As he stared out across the river, Alexander still thought the end of the earth was near. His teacher Aristotle had taught him India was a short peninsula jutting into the great ocean which circled the earth. As far as he knew, they didn't have far to go. But here at the Bias, when Alexander questioned local people about the road ahead, new and unexpected information came into his hands. The end of the earth was not near. Two or three weeks' march from the Bias was a far bigger river, the Ganges, and a great kingdom with a vast army and thousands of war elephants. How far is it? How many kilometers is it from uh, from here to Delhi? 500. Yeah. Yeah. Long distance. Yeah. The Greek army could do about 30 kilometers a day, so uh, well, they could do that in three weeks, couldn't they? Uh -huh. uh, it opens in uh, October. Looking out across the river, Alexander, of course, was all for pushing on. But now, after eight years and 17,000 miles, the troops had reached breaking point. The king urged them to one last great effort, but he was greeted with silence. No one dared speak. They were too frightened. And then one of the senior commanders, Coenus, plucked up the courage. Sir, you said you would never lead us as a dictator, he began rather daringly. You always said you were open to persuasion. Well, let me speak now, not on our behalf, but on behalf of the ordinary rank and file of the army. Most of the men who came out with us from Greece have left their bones out there on the roads of Asia. And those that remain are battered in body and weary in spirit. Just look at them, their gears ruined. They're wearing patched up Indian clothes. They've had enough. 
Sir, under your leadership, our achievements have been simply wonderful. But the will of the gods can't forever be taken for granted. Surely the time has come now to set a limit to our endeavors. The king had reached the moment on which his life would turn. It's been the subject of legend ever since. It's even in the Hindi movies. The king was beside himself with fury. For three days he sulked in his tent. Then, seeing the army's mood, Alexander asked the gods for a sign. The army waited on tenterhooks. The omens were bad. Alexander accepted the will of the gods and agreed to turn back. And what if they'd gone on to the Ganges, China even? The whole of history might have been different, but it was not to be. Before he turned back, he made altars to the gods who'd brought him so far. Dionysus, Apollo, Hercules. And an inscription. Alexander stopped here. Back on the Chelum River, he'd ordered a fleet to be built, ready to journey down the Indus to the ocean. A thousand vessels all told. They included Greek galleys. The last of the old master boat builders on the Indus chuckled at the idea. These Greek warships, he said, would never cope with the Indus. He sketched a few modifications to Alexander's naval plans. Flat bottoms, he said. That's what's needed. So, if they were going to build a fleet like this, in six months they had to build a fleet like this, it would need, they would need a very big uh, workforce. <laughs> Not possible, but Alexander did it. He set sail mid-November, the main army marching with him along the river bank. They cast off to the sound of bands, and were watched by the Indians who followed for a while in amazement. With the army now were thousands of women and children, Indians, Bactrians, Central Asians, all captives of war. Among them was Alexander's teenage wife, Roxanne. That autumn, Roxanne gave birth to a baby boy. The king had finally produced an heir. But the child died and was buried by the banks of the Jilam. How did Alexander feel? Did he see this as a sign? All we know is that he plunged himself back into war. The journey down the Indus took seven months. It led them through great kingdoms and past ancient cities. Everywhere in today's Pakistan, Alexander met resistance, whose ferocity perplexed him. It's with the journey down the Indus that the whole tenor of the expedition seems to change. 
The Greeks had been through heavily populated countries before, like Iraq and Egypt, but the people hadn't resisted. Here they did. And now we start to get the first reports of atrocities and the large-scale massacre of civilians. In the new year, he attacked a big city in the lower Punjab. The city of a people called the Malians, today is Multan. The city was then, as it still is, surrounded by high walls of brick. Walls which have been assaulted many times since Alexander's day. The last being the British siege of 1849. Local legend says Alexander's siege broke through at a place called the Tower of Blood. Basically the green troops are outside the walls. I mean it can't have been exactly this spot but it's as good a place to tell the story as any. Alexander thought the troops were slacking. He put a siege ladder against the wall and he went up himself, led the troops. Behind him were only three, three men, two of his bodyguards, one of them holding the sacred shield from Troy and another an NCO, Avreas. And uh, Alexander held his shield above him and up he went. And here's the Macedonian siege ladder itself. Yeah. As they reached the top, the weight of the troops behind broke the ladder, leaving the four men on their own. So long! It's all right, I'm only a Macedonian soldier. When Alexander got onto the top, he crouched on the top of the wall, says Arian, behind his shield. The other three men came up with him. And then, at that moment, surrounded by Indian defenders, exposed on the wall, he took his life into his own hands and leapt into the fortress rather than outside, leaving the rest of the army behind. Then the Indian defenders closed in on him and he was forced to throw stones at them, beat them off with his sword and so on. The rest of the army behind, panic-stricken, tried to find a way of getting into the city while the four men desperately defended themselves. The NCO Avreas was hit by an arrow in the face and killed and then Alexander himself was struck by an arrow that went in the open bit underneath his armour, straight into his lungs. He collapsed on the floor, bleeding profusely, and the bodyguard, Pevkestas, straddled him, holding the sacred shield from Troy and trying to beat off the Indian attackers. You can imagine the paramedics rushing Alexander back to the camp. Meanwhile, panic spread through the army. They feared that with Alexander dead, they'd never see home again. They went berserk and massacred everyone in the city. Alexander's surgeon prepared to operate. Critobulus of Kos had been his father's doctor. He'd once taken an arrow from King Philip's eye. Over the years, Alexander had taken punishment which would have stopped an ox. Leg and thigh wounds, a catapult bolt in the shoulder, 21 wounds in all. This, though, was the most serious. His lung was pierced. The story here is that the arrow was poisoned and that Alexander never really recovered. Now, the Greek historians don't mention this, but the traditional doctors here, the Hakims, claim descent from Alexander's doctors.
They practice what they call Greek medicine, so perhaps they should know. But poison or not, both doctor and patient knew that Alexander was very close to death. For a week, Alexander's life hung in the balance. Then they gently floated him along the river so the army could see he was alive. They cried with relief. They still loved him. The journey down the Indus took from November until the next summer, fighting all the way. Alexander founded another Alexandria at the confluence of the rivers. In July, he reached the Indus Delta. His fleet explored the arms of the Indus and its journey has been pieced together by Monique Kevran. We drove across the bay where Alexander coasted that summer. All this plain was sea then, but it's silted now, leaving the islands high and dry. On the walls, so you see the yeah. dimension. Yeah. dimension. Maybe you, you want to see the oh, thanks, position yeah. of this tower. Yeah. Alexander's admiral, Nearchus, says he built fortifications at a place he called Alexander's Harbour. They were here on this spot. Oh yes, spot. yes, that is clearly written in the ancient text. Oh. And they survive eating uh, oysters. Uh -huh. Arian mentions this. <laughs> yes, yes, ah. oysters and mussels and uh, of a very big size. Ah. Yeah. So it is possible then that these are left by the Greek uh, soldiers during their stay here. I let you tell it, <laughs> but I believe. The oysters couldn't be from Islamic times because eating shellfish is against the Muslim religion. Most likely, it was Alexander's Greeks who left these shells. They were very happy after, uh, from so long time, they have left the, their country to, to have oysters, mm. seafood. Alexander's last act in India was to build altars, just as he'd done in Central Asia and the Punjab. He put them on a tiny island in the sea. It's never been found, but in the middle of the Delta Plain is another long-forgotten island, the last before the open sea. This was perhaps Alexander's last landfall in India. Perhaps he stood on this spot, staring out to sea, as his fleet set sail for the Gulf following the line of the setting sun. Alexander planned his return from India as a combined operation by land and sea. And with the help of the Pakistan Navy, we tried to trace his fleet's progress along the bleak coast of the Makran. The logbook of Alexander's Admiral Nearchus survives, an eyewitness we could still follow after 2,000 years. Now the Greek logbook of the expedition, he actually mentions a number of places. For instance, they went round a, a great promontory or a cape which stuck far out into the sea and was very high and precipitous. This is the Ras uh -huh. It's a big mountain here, it's about uh, 1,400 feet high. Wow. It's 1,400 feet high, it's a yeah. big mountain, and yeah. it's sticking out in sea. There's one other kind of little story that he tells in this, which is, is particularly interesting. He says that about 10 miles off the shore, maybe roughly, yeah. there was an island, 
and it was uninhabited. They said yes. no human right. being ever went there. In fact, it was something of a kind of ill-omened place. This is this is right in front of you. Is uh, Astola Island? Yeah. You know, on, a, on a bigger chart, you can see. Yeah. It's Astola Island is uh, uninhabited, and yeah. it's a if good see landmark. See the distance. Yes, my Small. divider is open ten miles. So and if you see from Astola, the land so is about 12, 12 miles. miles. It's, it's, it's roughly right. So water yeah. must have receded two miles. Yeah. It says yeah. the Greeks were rather were frightened of the, the stories about this island, that you shouldn't step on it. And in fact, they sailed around the island shouting to, <laughs> to uh, check that there weren't any kind of spirits before well, they stepped on it. In my 20 years <laughs> naval career, we have never been there. <laughs> so we got in October, Alexander began his return journey with the land army. 100,000 strong now, with tens of thousands of camp followers. And we followed into the dreaded Makran Desert. From Turbat, the main route to Iran goes straight as a die westwards up the Ketch Valley. But Alexander didn't take it. He now turned off the main route and headed south for the sea. It's only a hundred miles, but it goes through the harshest terrain. The Greeks found impoverished settlements of Aboriginal people they called the fish eaters, too poor to give them supplies. We've been on this road now for 10 hours. We've had uh, half a litre of water and two oranges each. <laughs> I don't think we took the preparations for this leg of the trip as seriously as we should have done. But then I don't think Alexander the Great did either. In fact, coming this way uh, makes me think it was a crazy notion to bring an army through here. The last big spring is 50 kilometres back. The Greeks, you can be sure, were in trouble before they even hit the sea. At the sea, there was no sign of the fleet, only the boats of the fish eaters. Alexander should have gone back now the way he'd come, but that wasn't his way. He decided to push on, sticking to the coast. Perhaps he was hoping to establish ports to link his empire. Perhaps he still hoped to meet the fleet. We don't know. From here, the only way to follow him was by camel. An outsider will die on this route, yeah? Is right? An outsider will die, yeah. He won't be able to find anyone. Oh, great. That's, that's extremely comforting to know. Is, is, is there water on, on, the, on the route? Are there actually spring water holes along the route? Or do we have to carry the water? He says that uh, uh, there is very few water springs. He says, if I go, I, I, if I, if I, go, I can't find those. We better, take some, we better take somebody with us who can. Then. And so we left the burning shore by the great rock of Pazni in the footsteps of Alexander's last epic march. The journey for Alexander's army soon became a nightmare. Greeks came into an area of great hills of sand. And then Arian says they, their feet sank in like treading into untrodden snow. And the horses and the mules just couldn't cope with that at all because they didn't have camels as we do. And sometimes Arian says they had to go through the whole night without water.
and in the morning they'd be leaving people behind who are sick or ill or just too tired or absolutely dying of thirst and of course those people were never seen again they were lost says Arian like people fallen overboard and lost at sea Now, for the first time in his life, he was staring at defeat. Why did he come here to the Makran? I just don't know. He was trying to get back to Iran, I guess. Um, but why he came here to this coast, uh, I don't understand. I don't understand. Alexander became greatly distressed because they were traveling through such awful terrain, says the geographer Strabo. According to one source, only a quarter of the army survived. The truth will never be known. But even though he was in such desperate straits, Alexander still showed flashes of his old self. Alexander was leading the army on foot, as he often did to encourage the troops. And everybody was absolutely desperate for thirst. And some soldiers found a tiny bit of water in a dried up stream bed and brought it to him just a, in a helmet and in front of the whole army he poured it away into the sand if they couldn't drink then he wouldn't the Greeks always cited this story as being proof of his noble character personally I find it a little frightening that after all that he would put them through they could still be won over by his tricks But the truth is, they still loved him and still needed his leadership to pull them through. And he still needed them in order to be Alexander. Out here you really do wonder why on earth he brought his army through this appalling wilderness. <laughs> Almost makes you wonder whether he wanted to punish them for what happened to the Beas River, for, for not following him to the ends of the earth. But among the Greeks the most popular explanation was this, simply that it was there. He'd been told the journey was impossible for an army and because of his inner demon he just had to do it. He had to excel everybody. He had to do what nobody else had done. And of course, in the past, his gambles had always paid off. It took him 60 days to get through the Makran. In the spring, he arrived back in Persepolis, from where he'd set off east seven years before. He walked through the burned palace of the Persian kings, destroyed at his orders. And with hindsight, he regretted what he'd done. After all, he was the king now. He was now wearing the robes and tiara of the Persian Shah. He could no longer be a mere conqueror, a seeker after glory. Now he had to rule the biggest empire the world had ever seen. And Iran was now the center of his universe. He still had great plans, among them to conquer the West. But fate, or the will of the gods, was closing in. There, suddenly, after a massive binge, his dearest friend and lover, Hephaestion, died. Alexander was almost suicidal in his grief. Others loved me because I was king, he said. 
Hephaestion loved me for myself. The bazaars were rife with rumour. Some spoke of poison, that the king too did not have long to live, that the omens were against him, that he'd lost his sense of purpose. The legend is still told by the traditional tale-tellers in Iran. That last spring, he moved back into Iraq. Now obsessed with every omen, the king dithered while his soothsayers argued over the flight of birds. The signs, they said, were plain. He must not enter Babylon. Till now, he'd never ignored the gods, but now he did. By the banks of the Euphrates, after another heavy drinking session, the king fell ill. The wounds, alcohol, grief had finally taken their toll. Imagine the claustrophobia of the palace, the hanging gardens with their forest of palms, the somnolent heat of the river, there's a diary of those last days. It's one of the most dramatic records in history. This is the account of the king's last days. It comes almost word for word from the royal diaries. On the 29th of May, he slept in the bathroom because he was feverish. He spent the next day playing dice. 31st, he bathed and lay down in the bathroom, listening to Nearchus tell the story of the return of the fleet from India. On the 1st of June, the fever grew more intense. He had a bad night, and all through the next day, his fever was very high. 5th of June, they moved him to the other side of the river. There he slept a little, but the fever did not abate. The Macedonian veterans now believed he was dead, and pushed their way into the palace to see him a last time. The motive in almost every heart was grief, and a sort of helpless bewilderment at the thought of losing him. Lying speechless as the men filed by, he still struggled to raise his head, and with his eyes gave a look of recognition to each individual as he went past. On the 10th of June, towards evening, he died. After 20,000 miles, our journey was over. It ended where it began, in the shadow of Mount Olympus, the home of the gods. Alexander's search for eternal glory was cut short, and ever since he's carried the weight of an unfulfilled destiny, the hero who flew too close to the sun and whose wings were burned. But today the verdict of history is harsher, a man broken in the end by the loneliness and insanity of absolute power. Is that how we should see Alexander's career now? As a self-destructive madness rather than everlasting glory? I'll tell you what I think, for what it's worth, having followed in his footsteps for this far. And that is that all the evils unleashed by men of war in our own time 
teach us that we should reject Alexander's ideals. But Alexander was a man of his time, not of ours. He believed in the gods and he would have accepted their verdicts, both for good and ill. If he could answer us here now, I'm sure he would say, like the tragic hero that he is, let the gods be my judges, for in every sign that they gave me, they told me no lie. To learn more about Michael Wood and his journey in the footsteps of Alexander the Great, visit our website at PBS Online, www.pbs.org. Footsteps of Alexander the Great was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the annual financial support of PBS viewers like you. This is History's Best on PBS.